Chapter 7 Valley of the Kings On the day of Tut's burial, a long line of people followed his coffin in boats across the Nile. Once on land, the coffin, actually there were three, like nesting dolls, was pulled on a sled. It was going to a royal graveyard. This dusty, lonely area west of the Nile was called the Valley of the Kings. In some photographs, the area looked like a natural pyramid made of rock. Many other pharaohs were buried there, so priests stood guard day and night. Nearby was a separate cemetery for queens and members of the court. It was called the Valley of the Queens. At the head of the parade to the Valley of the Kings were the priests. Along the way, they sang songs and chanted prayers. One of the priests wore a mask with a dog face on it. He was supposed to represent Anubis, the god of mummies. Tut's young queen walked nearby. Following behind her were a group of women. They would have all been wailing and crying and tearing at their clothes. These mourners were there to express sadness over Tut's death. After the mourners came servants, hundreds of them. They were carrying all the furniture, food, and other items to go in the tomb. They also brought along many little statues that looked like servants. Once these were placed in the tomb, it was believed that the statues would come to life. Then the dead king would have all the servants he needed to take care of him. At the entrance to the tomb, Tut's mummy was propped upright. The time had come for a very important ceremony. It was called the opening of the mouth. While the prayer was said, a priest touched the eyes, mouth, and ears of the mummy. The magic was believed to bring the pharaoh back to life again. He would be able to speak and see and hear. After that, the only thing left to do was bury the pharaoh inside his tomb. Once Tut's mummy was back in its coffins, it was placed inside a great stone box and hidden deep inside the tomb. A pile of rocks sealed up the entrance. Afterward, all the mourners took part in a great feast. Everyone was joyful now for the dead king. Tut was about to enter the land of the dead. He would live and be happy forever. They were sure that his mummy was safe, hidden away for all eternity. But they were wrong. Chapter 8 Mummy Mania Ancient robbers were not the only ones who looted tombs in Egypt. In the 1800s, people from many different countries in Europe began traveling to Egypt. The ancient kingdom was long gone. The old beliefs had disappeared. The squiggly picture writing, hieroglyphs, was a mystery to everyone. But tourists visited the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx. They took trips down the Nile River. They saw the ruins of old temples and giant statues. They wanted to bring back souvenirs. Sometimes what they brought back was a whole mummy. They might keep it in a room with other souvenirs they had bought. Or they might decide to unwrap the mummy and see what was inside. Unwrapping parties were held. One English lord sent out printed cards for the party. His guests in London got to see a mummy from Thebes unrolled at half past two. A German prince in Berlin had a mummy unwrapped on his pool table. If a person couldn't afford a mummy all by himself, he could join a group. The group would pool their money and buy a mummy together. That's what a group of German people did. They each had a certificate. It was like owning shares of a mummy. One man from Italy started a business of finding mummies to sell to customers. His name was Giovanni Belzoni. Sometimes he used a battering ram to get inside a tomb. He described an accident he had inside one. Feeling his way with a torch, he was looking for some place to sit. What he landed on was all his weight were mummies. 
I sank right down between broken mummies, a confusion of bones, rags, wooden boxes, which threw up such a lot of dust that for a quarter of an hour I was unable to move. It is terrible to hear stories about the ancient dead being treated like this, just so someone could get rich quick. Of course, not all mummy hunters were in it for the money. Many people were interested in learning more about ancient Egypt, what life was like back then. People interested in objects that tell us about the past are called archaeologists. The End of an Empire Different historians give different dates for the end of the great kingdom of ancient Egypt. Some say that ancient Egypt was gone by 30 BC. By this time, there had been many invasions by other countries. Some very famous foreigners ruled Egypt and became pharaoh. Alexander the Great took Egypt from the Persians. The Egyptians thought of the great Greek soldier as a hero. After Alexander died, one of his generals, Ptolemy I, took over. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar Perhaps you have heard of Cleopatra. She was a queen of Egypt who lived from 69 to 30 BC. Julius Caesar was emperor of the Roman Empire. The Romans took over Egypt. Cleopatra thought if she had Caesar's child, she would have more power. But it didn't work out that way. The Romans stayed in power. Within 100 years, the old Egyptian way of life was vanishing. Hieroglyphs had become a dead language. It became the job of archaeologists to uncover the past. By the late 1800s, many tombs of the pharaohs had been found. The trouble was that all of them were empty. The dream of every archaeologist was to find one that hadn't been looted. Many thought that was just a wild dream. They didn't believe there was even one tomb left with treasures. Howard Carter was particularly the only man who thought there was.